So the idea, roughly, the idea is that that means a change of category. We, we try always to strive to deepen the knowledge, the level of the knowledge, the, or the refinement, or whatever. On the other hand, we don't always stick with the most refined, because we, we back up to a much coarser picture if that's sufficient for a certain purpose. So, and we also back up in another way when we approximate solutions of partial differential equations by means of the finite element method, numerical analysis, and so forth. So the, the idea is that in general, all this kind of different levels or degrees of cohesion amounts, is analyzed as a series, or not a series, but a system of categories. It isn't just one category, it needs to be a system of categories. When you make a qualitative change in the depth, change from one category to another, but let's say most of the time you stay within one category, you go to another, and so there are these two kinds of, of motion. So that's what I'm trying to, trying to explain. Also, of course, in general, the idea is that, that uh, traditional philosophical notions for thousands of years could be given a mathematical formulation sufficiently general using the most up-to-date technology we have in mathematics, i.e. dopos theory, etc., etc., could be given uh, a formulation which in some sense almost fully captures the philosophical content, not just some fragment of it. And so that, uh, so that philosophical considerations could become open to, um, to some degree to calculation as Leibniz, for example, dreamed. So, the first idea is to distinguish between generalized spaces. I've just called objects of these categories spaces to distinguish them from maybe other kinds of categories where you might speak of algebra. Spaces, a space I remember when I, in my early, early days of my collaboration with, with Steve Shanuel, I was trying to explain something to him, and I said, let X be a space. And he said, well, what kind of a space? Give me a topological space? No, no, just a space. What's that? <laughs> well, it's an object in a spatial category. Oh, I see, okay. <laughs> but the point is that, <laughs> that that response is actually very meaningful. <laughs> but at first glance, it might seem as, as a mere verbal circumlocution, but it is actually so in, a, so in a way, the, the idea is to define what is a category of space. It's a category, but it's a special kind of category, and, and then we can just say a space of this or that category. So, <clears throat> so we need to distinguish between the spaces themselves and the categories in which they live. Okay. It is often said that the basic idea of a topos is that it is a generalized space. In fact, both historically and in terms of intrinsic content, that is an oversimplification. An oversimplification that has distracted attention, distracted the attention of, you know, of category theorists and so on, from the development of a useful class of toposes which can be more accurately described as consisting of objects that are generalized spaces, objects in the category, rather than one category being the thing. In order to display more sharply the contrast, let me first survey briefly some of the kinds of a generalized space that are, after all, related to individual toposes. Of course, the original connection between spaces and topos, this was via the Ray lazard notion of sheaf, which, which uh, came up in order to generalize and systematize well-established experience 
in the field of complex analysis. To generalize from the complex spaces to the supposedly default nation of space, quote unquote, which is based on a partially ordered set, which satisfies conditions appropriate to open regions of space, partially an open set of open regions. Um, as a basis for the category of sheep, so it's so-called localic topos. This was the first kind of generalized space. And, but in fact, uh, the she sheaves first appeared as linear sheaves, and in analysis even today, linear sheaves are the most frequent, sheaves of functions and vector bundles and so forth and so on. Although it was, it was recognized already in the 1950s that these linear sheaves are very effectively considered as linear objects in the nonlinear category of set-like sheaves. Uh, hence the notion of topos, basically. Or that was one of the origins of the notion of topos. Now these, these sheaves, that, the original sheaves, had to have a dual description. They are either local homeomorphisms or they are special pre-sheaves. Pre-sheaves of sections which always satisfy so-called sheaf conditions. The two, the two descriptions, at one point, Grotendieck said we have to forget the local homeomorphism point of view because in the generalizations that we want, uh, the pre-sheaf point of view is the only one that works. Of course, it turned out that the local homeomorphism description did generalize quite a bit too. But basically, one point is that in terms of the pre-sheaf point of view, one has that's always accompanied by the sheaf condition, compatibility, compatibility with coverings. And this principle of compatibility of coverings was um, Clearly a good generalization because it not, it not only held for pure topology, but also for smooth and analytic geometry. In other words, the fact that a, that a the map or a, or a section or something is uh, smooth on each part of the covering implies that it is smooth, or even better, if it's given on each part of the covering in a compatible way, then it even exists globally. That if and only if, which is known as the sheaf condition, was uh, applied equally well to analytic, the existence of analytic and uh, smooth as well as continuous. And it was found out by, by Sayre that it also worked in, uh, in algebraic geometry, which applies for polynomial maps. Well, <clears throat> Perhaps the first and most obvious generalization of this kind of category of sheaves was something almost opposite in a way, namely the actions of a given group on discrete sets. Because this was very appropriate because actually groups and space, groups and traditional spaces live in the same world because with the space you have universal covering space, but you also have the Poincaré groupoid, fundamental of the groupoid, of the Eilenberg McLean spaces and so forth, which has to do directly with the interaction of groups and uh, top of the traditional spaces, which part of which can be explained better if it takes place in one category. So one needed to generalize the notion of space from topological spaces at least to the level of, of permitting groups to run around as objects in the same, same category. So within the general setting of toposes, which is much, much more general, Grotendieck first isolated a small part of it, which he called the étendu, which contains both the sheaves on the post set of regions, as well as the actions of a group or a groupoid. Those two fairly disparate kinds are united under the notion of étendu, which is most simply described, simply as a, in, the, in the appropriate language, as a topos which is locally like sheaves on the post-set of regions. Which it turns out includes 
in an apparently laughable way, namely, the group is locally one point space, which analysts like to amuse people by saying, consider you know, the group acting on a one point space. This has a lot of information in it, despite the apparent <laughs> triviality. And the, but that, that content starts with the with the connection which I have uh, So Grundy defined the notion of etendu as a topos that is locally of the kind defined by a post set of open regions, and it turned out that an etendu is always uh, obtained if more generally we start with a category, a site, which as a, which as a category consists only of monomorphisms. every map is invertible, i.e. a groupoid, then of course everything is a monomorphism. On the other hand, in a post set, everything is trivially a monomorphism. So that's obviously a generalization. It takes a few minutes to, to realize that uh, such a thing is locally, in the appropriate sense, a post set. And, and so, uh, but then conversely, any, it turned out that any uh, Grodendieck topos, which is locally like the sheaves on a post set of regions, does in fact have a site which consists of a monomorphisms. Okay, and on the other hand, One, one has to keep in mind that the, uh, these so-called generalized spaces are not just the, the topos of sheaves on them. No more than the lattice of open regions itself determines the space. Because if it's a smooth space, or an analytic space, or an algebraic space, and so on, there is, in addition to the post set of regions, there is always the sheaf of local rings. That's why one talks about ring the topos. And it's absolutely essential you have this, this kind of topos, this, this kind of topos, together with a ring object in it, or you lose completely the, the connection. The product, for example, with the pure topos, this is not the same as the product in the category pairs consisting of topos as equipped with rings. So, uh, in particular, I mean, that's a simple example of that. Uh, the spectrum of a ring is not a topological not as a risky, huh? people study that space, but it's really only just, just in, in a, in a uh, very poor way connected with the scheme because at least as essential as the sheaf of, of local rings. So when, when one pushes the picture down to a, a single space in that way, um, an additional structure is created which has to be carried along with it. So the sheaf of holomorphic or smooth functions, which of course is incorporated in a linearized theory, provided we construe it as being a monoidal abelian category and so on. But the fact, the fact that the, the product of underlying toposes or underlying topological spaces is quite different from the product of schemes means that an algebraic group is not a topological group. There is no underlying topological group. The notion of group depends on the notion of Cartesian product, and that's not preserved by this forgetting process. So, <clears throat> I think, by the way, that in the case of algebraic geometry, that mismatch can be uh, considerably uh, alleviated if one considers that the base topos is not, after all, abstract sets, but rather the uh, Galoisian topos of sheaves on the category of finite field extensions, which um, you know, reduces to abstract sets only in case the ground field is already algebraically closed. Because by working in that, that which is a Boolean topos, working in that Boolean topos instead of an abstract set, one, one gets much better, a much better match uh, with, with the geometry. That remark, elaborating that remark, you see, is not really only a, a fragment 